Hey, David, sorry, a few minutes late today. No worries. Okay, I do hope after we go through, I'm gonna add the agenda item for us to, uh, you know, finish discussion on the uh, discuss milestone items. Let me add that to the agenda. Uh, Yeah, and then and then just like um, I was just thinking to look at all the issues that um, all the things that have been completed since the last release, and then just try and decide on you know if it's alpha two or whatever we want to call it, um, because we have uh, what ten days left in the month or so. So yeah, I don't know. I think kind of try and cut it, make a make a cut line on what we want for the, the release across the three repos. I agree. So, we, so we've been calling it alphas and I think we have done alpha one and alpha two. We have released notes for that and, I'll, and I can show you the link to it in a, here, uh, but okay. let's give the floor to Milan and I'll queue it up for yep. discussion later on the call. Yep. Sounds good. Yeah, if, if you wanna, because this is the planning meeting, if you want to finish the planning, how, depends on how much time it's going to take. I plan to discuss the verification plugin uh, PR updates to that. Uh, that will involve some reading of updates. So I see Steve is here. Uh, if Sajay, waiting on Sajay and Roy also to join, will they be attending? Roy can't attend today. He got pulled into another meeting. Okay. Um, I can start then let's see this is the first pr for the multiple trust store custom verification level that we discussed last time uh, give me a second while i share my screen Can folks see my screen? Yes. All right. So I think the last feedback was this around how to represent the verification, signature verification level and custom. Uh, so I made that change. We're not using multi type attributes now. Uh, and here is the just walking through that change quickly. So it's always an object now. And uh, there should be an example with the override. Oh, the example with the override is already present. So it's not in the diff. And uh, I just updated the examples a bit, added some more description, etc. So this is ready to be reviewed and approved it has all the changes that we agreed on uh, it's blocking other spec changes so i want uh steve at least if you can review and approve i'm i ping sajay also on this yesterday i can take a look to later today all right and um get to the second one So this is the verification plugin um, PR. I added a section just talking about portability uh, because that was kind of the major point of discussion last time around like how the verification plugin interacts with portability. So there's an appendix in signature spec that talks about portability, what it means for public and private artifacts. And there are two aspects in Notary V2, signature discovery and verification requirement. That So this whole section till here, guidelines for Notary V2 
uh, I would like to use some time to actually read through. I'll share the link. Uh, I want some feedback on, on this content and if we are on the right track. So I'll paste the link. Give me a second to do the chat. Here. So that's the that's pointing to the commit that just added the portability section. Uh, if I can get a read and any high level review comments or comments in the PR itself, that would be great. We can take around 10 minutes. Uh, it's about a page. Sounds good. Lynn, can you paste that again? I'm sorry. Ping the link again? Yeah, chat, uh, Zoom just didn't carry it over when I went from my phone to my computer. Sure. The main changes are in the signature specification. And as a there's a small update on the plugin extensibility. Only two docs in that diff.
Steve said he's ready. Uh, anybody else need more time? All right, let me share screen again. Can you see my screen? Yep. All right. Um, you think what is the intent when <clears throat> users are multi cloud hybrid with on prem? I think. Um, I think I cover a bit of that here, right? Maybe images uh, intended to run on any infrastructure run on. I can call out the other combination that can run on multi cloud. I think I, this I, I, kind. Sorry, Steve. I was going to say is I think this kind of goes more from the ownership perspective, right? Um, either of those um, could be multi-crowd, hybrid, uh, and on-prem. Um, this really is kind of saying who is the decision maker in saying what needs to get validated for the artifact. So when you consider public artifacts, this is saying I am signing an artifact and releasing it for broad consumption. Uh, whereas a private artifact is si signing something that I'm using for my own internal use. Um, and in both of those scenarios, um, you are going to have the potentially have like a multi-cloud and hybrid solution with on-prem. Um, but this is really more identifying the owners of who's saying what, you know, the um, criteria for evaluating um, signatures is going to look like. Yeah, that is good. Yeah, I think it's just, there's a little bit of complexity here that somebody has to make a conscious choice when they're signing something, where will this go? And what limitations does it have on the intent of the signature? Yeah, it's just, these are just, it's more complexity for somebody to consider when they're trying to accomplish something. And it just wasn't in the our original goals to have, like the idea was a signature was a signature and it can just get verified. So I just, I'm okay with it. I just think it's, you're, we're starting to put more clarity around it and that's good. Um, it just, uh, it, just a concern. I'm not sure it's a blocker. I just raising this the concern. I think, uh, I, I get what you're saying. I think a couple of, couple of things that, if like having an application or a service be able to run in any environment is a conscious architectural choice that you have to take pretty early on. I think what I mean by that is if you're just relying on infrastructure services, just servers with any provider, you can as well expect your applications to be portable. But in cases where you're using platform as service or any uh, authorization services, storage services, then you, you have more dependency on a particular vendor's implementation. So like in either case, just want to point out that like it's, it's a very conscious choice to say my application is designed with these specific goals. And that kind of flows into those are the same requirements you would want your signature to have. And in the basic case where you, we say if you sign, it can be verified anywhere. Even there, specifically for revocation check, based on which CA you got the certificate from and how the CA exposes their CRL, OCSP endpoints, it's not like, that it can be verified anywhere. There may be, like if a customer is using their own private CA, you won't be able to do revocation checks if they distribute it outside. I, I think what I mean to say is there needs to be some cognizance of where it's intended to be published and like what CA, what other dependencies I'm taking. So, I mean, imagine the container image format has a you know, generic standard that we've said is cross-cloud, right? That was kind of the whole intent. 
but now we define a set of attributes that says the container image can only be run with a particular vendor's component. No, I, I, I think there are layers to this, right? The, the container image, the format itself, the runtime registry, et cetera, they are agnostic, but what goes inside the container, that application can have strong dependencies to a particular environment. And then whoever is building that application is aware of those choices. Yeah, I think what I'd iterate here is that there's there's uh, the different layers to this, right? Like there is the the the, the part that we we're covering here is what does the signature look like? But you have additional components in terms of what does a, your PKI look like? Um, if you are, um, you know, when you're when you're distributing a private artifact which you're using within your own internal organization, let's say, um, there you you would not expose that PK information publicly, right? Um, and so there are sort of like I think um, differences in in other components beyond just the signing artifact um, that we need to account for, where these two different use cases uh, will require different sets of conscious decisions um, to address those use cases particularly. I mean, part of what we're doing is we're bringing in the revocation that we we said wasn't part of RC one. Yes. Well, it, it, even without RC1, I mean, even without revocation, right, just even thinking from a PKI perspective, right, um, you may not want your um, root trusts um, distributed publicly for any private artifact you're signing, right? Um, the that's potentially taking the pr public key, which I'm using that, I'm air quoting public, because to your point, it doesn't have to be general public. But I can copy that key from cloud one to cloud two and put it in that cloud provider's key vault and have completely separation and do the verification. Right, but what, but that's a, what we're saying is that like, you know, when you're doing that, that is an infrastructure decision and that is you are personally doing that. Whereas in a public setting, right, you would go share that public key and expect the deployer to kind of go be able to put that into any cloud. So who takes that action is different. Whereas here, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in the private artifact scenario, if you're running a hybrid uh, or multi-cloud, it's your administrator that's going out and deciding how to propagate the uh, root of trust uh, across all of those different vendors and they have the means to do so. In the public scenario, you are working on publishing that key information and making sure that any any consumer has access to kind of go and configure this in their environments in potentially any cloud environment, right? So I think this is kind of highlighting more into sort of how much more control you have uh, in which scenario and what you would likely dictate. Uh, what we kind of see here is in the public artifact scenario, you are agreeing on sort of doing some basic set of controls, whereas in the private scenario, you may have the need for additional controls based on sort of like your organizational needs, um, which would require some additional configuration, like for example, the, the, root, the, the root management, right? So I think that's how we are distinguishing the two scenarios. Um, and again, the kind of like the, uh, the, the underlying theme is that you can do both um, across um, any notation implementation. Um, but in some of these scenarios, you may do work that's beyond what uh, just the notation client is offering um, for kind of having certain sets of controls that you feel are needed for your use case. Okay, I, I, I see what we're trying to do. I just I, I said I'm raising concerns because I think it's, it's going against the portability aspect that we intended, so. Um, I think the portability is a, is a spectrum. Not all applications are intended to be 100% portable. And that, that's what this section calls out. Like for public artifacts, you definitely want them to be verified anywhere. Like being... oh, yeah, there's, there's a, in an app, there's a dependency on a certain service that might be very cloud specific, right? Take an ML platform yeah. or something like, totally get that. We just never intended that to be part of the signature. It's not even verification format. Like even signing, was there's a standard way to sign things. We just allow plugins to be able to do it, but the end result is a, a standard notary signature. So to be able to say you're locking something can only be done with particular verifier is the flag. Yeah, but I, I think the, the call out here is that it's both a user 
conscious choice and a vendor's choice who distribute the signing plugin that from both perspective and you are you're offering them the both choices if you intend to this is for public distribution then you should use a particular model and that is kind of the default model and in more specialized cases where you have certain other requirements where you don't really require portability or that's that's you, you can take additional steps to address that you have choice to have like extended verification capabilities, et cetera. It wasn't a choice that we, when we started, so it's just, um, all right, look, let's proceed. I, I think having the clarity in there um, helps users understand the choices that they're making. That we just need to make sure that we're providing a means for those hybrid customers to be able to operate easily. Cool. I will I will update the example here with kind of multi cloud hybrid. Um, moving to the next one, I think this is fine. I can update the language. You're, you're it's just about a standard thing that I've seen. I, I always get pushed back to even in Azure Docs. Like we can't predict the future. Just state the current as as the future changes. We make changes. That sounds good. Um, this TBD I wanted to discuss. Um, Sajay had brought up this point, uh, I think pretty early when we were talking about pulling and pushing signatures automatically. When you push, pull the, when you, when you pull and push an artifact, I think he had a scenario where some signatures are internal to an organization or should be considered private signatures and should not be automatically pushed. I don't see this being tracked anywhere. I'm just highlighting this as if this is a feature that we want to add, we should add it to post RC1, et cetera. Yeah, I'm not really sure I follow what we're talking about here. Uh, so that's basically, suppose you, you, you have an artifact in your internal registry and you have multiple signatures against it. And say some of those signatures are generated by your CI, CD or some audit process not really meant for distributing externally, mm -hmm. but your image is intended to be a public image. So say it mm -hmm. is a base OS image or some product image. So now you, through notation, you pushed the image. I think we haven't, I don't know where we are in terms of implementation of this. Um, notation will probably automatically push any signatures associated with that artifact. Are you talking about when you're copying an artifact from one registry to another? Yeah, should all signatures- Yeah, that's not a notary, sorry, that's, that's not a notary concept. That's more of the reference types are, uh, concept. And the and it doesn't matter whether it's multiple signatures or different SBOMs or claims. Basically what we've said is when we copy, we want the ability to filter on generic properties. This is why the annotations is so important. It's not that the annotation helps with a fingerprint that notary knows how to do something with it. Is how does how do we expose something generically so that tools that don't know about particular artifact types, such as notary, such as SPDX versus Cyclone DX, how do we put an attribute, an annotation, sorry, it's an attribute, but I meant annotations are a quoted attribute. How do we put some generic information so tools like Oras can say, hey, as I'm copying from registry or repo one to registry or repo two, how do I filter certain things out? So having a notary annotation that gives, it's not a fingerprint, but gives some kind of information that says, hey, I only want to promote or I want to filter out, let's just say I want to filter out things that come from my internal CI CD system because I know some string versus um, I want to promote things that have a public signature. That's the reason why we wanted the annotation. That that makes sense. I think what I'm not clear on is, is so right now we have sign and uh, yeah, sign, which by default does a push and only for the signature that it generated in sign. So like, does notation need to be 
doing any filtering during push? Uh, are you referring to the cache feature? Because a sign, there is no push API, right? We, we punted the push API. The push is part of the sign itself, right? It's an internal implementation. In other words, you say, I want to sign an artifact that's in a registry. Yeah. So okay. you provide the key for it, remote signing or not, doesn't matter from a registry perspective, it receives the thing that you sign and that's it. There is nothing that you can say push and it picks up other arbitrary signatures that are cached on the machine. Okay. And I, I agree with, uh, I agree with Steve here. There's no way we can identify whether this registry is internal registry or external registry. And if a user can do it, he can just choose not to execute the command itself. All right, I think I'll drop that. I think if it comes up in any of the flows, we'll figure that out. And I think we already have another issue to finalize the set of annotations. So then we can decide on what annotation we should use for the filtering. Exactly. Yeah, so 274 basically gets removed from here, but the scenario was captured in the annotations for filtering. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. At least that's my, and just, I want to put a caveat. At least that's my interpretation of what line 274 was discussing. Yeah, that's what it is discussing. And then we can, we can bring it back if we see any workflow which requires looking at that annotation. Um, local here is local on disk keys. Uh, also the raw signature generator is what is like, cloud provider ISV integration. I will clarify the language. Okay, so it's just, you're not referring to, I have a private key local, you're just talking about a cloud is the local. No, no, this is when I said local keys, it meant on disk, on disk keys. Wait, for signing or verification? For signing. Well, now I'm confused. Because I, I, sorry, let me go back, read the page. What line was that? Oh, here we go, so notation. Oh, I see. So I don't understand why. I think you're tying. I okay. Sorry, I'm trying to digest. What you did is you tied the concept that if I'm using a local key for the startup scenario, the, the getting started scenario, that we're also making sure that it does. It couldn't be tied to some other verifier. Yeah. I, I don't know if that coupling is needed. I, I, I think I get what you're trying to do, but I'm not sure I understand the intent. So the getting started, you, the getting started is not kind of the intention. The intention is like right now we have the generate test, test or test key that needs to be redone in a better form that can support production level with, with encrypted keys, et cetera. So this, this is saying if you use, so we, we called out what portability means for artifacts and what portability means for signatures. So here it is saying based on a user's requirement, whether they want broad portability or limited portability. Uh, if you if you sign using the using notation tool with local keys or signing plugin of type raw signature generator, it 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 will always generate signatures that are that can be verified anywhere. I don't and, understand the coupling though. So I might have a secured environment. So I think we want to, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to tease out the fact that notary generates a test certificate. The only reason we called it a test certificate was to try to imply that this is a self-signed key and blah, blah, blah. That doesn't mean that somebody doesn't have strong, you know, uh, private keys that have roots and other things that they're, they happen to bring quote local to the environment and the local environment might be a very secure build environment. It might be an IoT scenario that's got five layers of network isolation. So what they might use for how they do verifications, especially this model that you want to do verifier plugins, there's, I don't know why we would couple it and say, I couldn't use that ISV's verifier just because it was locally signed. No, it's, it's, it's not coupling it. It's basically saying, the, the only way, or I'll, I'll make it the inverse of what this sentence says. It's saying the only possibility where notation generates a signature 
that uses extended attributes is the, it's in the next line is you use an envelope generator type of plugin all the other scenarios will envelope produce generator. generator i don't understand what an envelope generator is compared to a <laughs> So, so there, there, there are two types of, so in the signing plugin spec, there are, there are two types of signing plugin. One is called a raw signature generator that just uses, a, a integrates with a key, a private key and integrates with a cryptographic basic sign operation. Uh, and the envelope generator generates the whole JWS or COSI envelope. And the, if we, and using the first type, which is the raw signature generator, notation is putting together all the elements that go in the signature envelope. And notation by default doesn't use any extended attributes. So this, this is basically calling out that if a customer signs using local keys, on disk keys, not making any call outs here about how secure, et cetera. Uh, and the other is using plugins of type raw signature generator, then it doesn't use any extended attributes. The other- Why would we limit that? Um, sorry? Why would we limit that? It's not limiting, it's it's what it's what it uses by default. That's what uses by default, but I could change it if I wanted to? Uh, it's not under user's control to use extended That's, attributes or not. Well, but go ahead, Nias, I think I heard you. Um, I was going to share some, I think, kind of similar kind of things. Like, I, I'm not sure where a customer would use like a raw signature generator versus an envelope generator and why this distinction would matter. So, for, for example, the uh, Azure Key Vault plugin is a raw signature generator. Uh, say, a uh, HashiCorp plugin or a PKCS, uh, whatever, HSM based, those will be raw signature generator. But if you have a signing service or some other plugin that wants to generate the whole en envelope, that is an envelope generator plugin. Um, does the, so those are, what you're saying is there's two different types of plugins based on sort of like, you know, what is actually being modified or changed. But, um, this seems um, worded slightly differently. I think the way I would kind of phrase this is if you're using the plugin um, that does just this, um, then it's generating sort of like, you know, a notation based signature. Whereas if you use a plugin that uses extended configurations, then, you know, or it uses additional generates optional attributes, then that kind of creates this different class of signature, right? Um, I think the raw signature generator seem, is, is that something like a customer is configuring when they use this or is that something that the plugin just does by default? It's what the plugin does by default. I think I, I recognize the gap here. I've been, from a user perspective, these concepts are not really surfaced. Uh, right. The, the plugin list command shows you what type of signing plugin it is. I'll make a reference to that. Yeah, I would reword this just from the user perspective as in what the user is seeing um, and what the implications of that are, right? Um, and so I think the this is probably a little bit more confusing than um, in, in terms of surfacing all these options that the user really can't do anything about. Right, I, I mean, I, at a high level, I want to call out like these, all these specs are not supposed to be end user documentation. The documentation is supposed to be in whatever. Uh, extract of this, which is made more user friendly, but I can change this to be a little more from a user's perspective. Well, it's more just the implement. I, I agree. I don't think end users are going to read this, it, but it's the implementers. And I just, I want to be, and I think you're seeing a couple of people chime in here. So I think we're just trying to understand, was this an intentional scoping? Was it trying to be helpful? Because it seems more confusing and limiting. If I want to have a private, if I want to have a locally a local key that is not, it happens to be a local key, but it's not a self-signed key. It might be a, you know, a, an issue, whatever you want to call it, a, a, an issued key from a root key. Not may not be public, but it might be part of my IoT deployment. The same kind of environment that doesn't use HTTPS either, because they have other 
ways of doing the security, they might want to do a special verifier plugin. So I just, I think we want to separate out that the key happens to be local, that in many and most, I would even say most cases is not a secure place. But there are times where people have very secure environments. And in fact, it's more secure to have it local because it's, they've already made it. It's not, it's not related. This is not making any call out on the security of using local keys. Yeah, I, I would echo Steve's point though here is that it doesn't matter where the key is stored for what you're describing here, right? What you're essentially describing here is if we use a plugin that uses the raw notation attributes, um, it has a certain behavior. Um, if you use a plugin that generates additional attributes, it has a different um, consideration. Um, the key location is almost irrelevant in this decision, right? That is right. That is right. Yeah, so I would just take out that reference to local keys and just kind of really talk about more um, what the plugin does and what that intended, what that behavior comes out to be. I think the addition of local keys here is confusing. Okay, I'll make that change. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, we are at almost 9.40. I will, I will give it back to Samir and David. So I'll make, I'll make the changes I uh, and I'll ping want Steve, also I'll ping uh, Roy and Sajay. Uh, again, like a bunch of work is blocked on this PR. If we can make progress on this PR, that'd be great. No, that makes sense. If we just clarify a couple of these things, I think we're close. Cool. I mean, you know, obviously this is the place where branches do come in helpful, you know, right? Like we've been, we have the cozy branch because we're making progress there and we want to make sure that we can get a bunch of things pulled together and and then make that you know stable and then you kind of merge that in if you have things that are dependent on some of these things um you know continue to make progress in a branch and you know we'll iterate through some of these and i you know because i i don't think we're we're not giving feedback just to block and slow it down we're going through a feedback process and they're the results are getting better as a result. Yeah, that's goodness. I think you're at a different point that are we really helping pro provide that feedback in a timely basis? So that's that's the piece because I've, I've seen a couple of these things go on where there's a bunch of people focus on one set of PRs, a couple of people focused on a set of other PRs and we're asking for folks to kind of do the, I realize I'm pointing my fingers, nobody can see me. We're asking for folks to kind of like, hey, can you help me review this? I'll help you review that because we need your eyes, not just as a gate to check in, but we value the feedback from the other. Yep. So let's just make sure we keep doing that. And just, and it's fine. Like that's what the Slack channel is for. Like, hey, need some help or tag people in the, the Git issue directly, the, the issue or PR. Cool, sounds good. Sorry, the wrong one. Okay, uh, jumping right in. So one decision we wanted to make was, uh, should we go ahead and do an alpha three? I think at this point we should do an alpha three and keep it separate from the RC one. We could choose to bring some of the RC one items into alpha three as well, but the alpha three goal was uh, finishing the implementation and then uh, and then uh, running with the uh, notation client with the implementation done for some time to get feedback before we go to the RC one, because once we go RC one, there's no breaking changes. So I'm proposing we go ahead and do alpha three. We have done alpha one and alpha two in the past with release notes present. Let's just do an alpha three and adjust the goal of alpha three as we seem as we deem fit. That's the first proposal. Um, I would question and say, what would alpha three enable? Like maybe we can take a stab at writing the release notes and review that. Yes, we can do that. Uh, at, a, at a high level, alpha three will be the will be the implementation of the specs that we have designed in alpha two and then some. <clears throat> so alpha three will be the first working client end to end that somebody can use to sign and verify. Well, it's not the use, first. We can sign and verify with alpha two. Well, but, <clears throat> alpha three with all the release with all the new specifications the that new you really do. Yes, yes. And that's the part that I wanted. I was watching some of the PRs come in because. <clears throat> we don't want the big bang of like, wow, there's like 500 files I have to review in one PR. At the same token, if we, because I saw a PR the other day that was asking for feedback because I think something about notation key didn't work because some of the stuff moved to the directory structure 
and not all the code was there. So how we we want to be able to put PRs in that hopefully don't, but may create some instability because there's two independent PRs that need to happen to make them work. Um, maybe a branch is better for that. But I think the point is, is I'd like to figure out what the user stories are for alpha three so that you can, it's not just spec related, it's what user stories can be completed in alpha three. And it's the opportunity for us to give feedback and, and make breaking changes because RC1, we can't. Like it, it just scares the hell out of me that we're just gonna jump this RC1 and say, yep, we're good, but we, nobody can get their hands on it and test anything. So how do we know we're, we're really good? That's fair. So uh, David and I can iterate on the Alpha 3 release notes and what the user stories will be in it uh, at a high level. I think we just talked through it, right? That it will be. Yeah, it'd be good to. Yeah, it'd be good to kind of see the user stories that we have planned for RC1 and Alpha 3. So we also know what's missing from Alpha 3 going into RC1. OK, so let me jump to that uh, then. Uh, so the concept of user stories is something we started using recently or over the last one month prior to that. And I'm waiting for my page to load. I don't know why it's taking forever. The concept of user stories is a good concept we should have started with. But in the past, we just described the thing we want to achieve, not in terms of a user story, but in terms of uh, the functionality. And uh, so some of the implied user stories are in it already. But if we want to go and look at explicit user stories you want to bring in, we can create those user stories or pull it from RC1 is my proposal. Yeah, we just pull, pull, okay. pull what we think is working from RC1 and there's an RC1 user stories uh, view there. You can click okay, on. great. So what I would like to do here is, uh, so we have, if you've agreed on, on alpha three and pulling in some of the RC1 stories into alpha three and doing an alpha three, that's great, we can do it. The rest of the time I wanted to use in this meeting was to look at the discuss item, which we were trying to do for RC1. Is Will that be a good use of time uh, together on the discuss items or you somebody wants to look at? There's, yeah, there's some other ones which uh, kind of, that there's the one that's still the alpha two that was brought, I brought out of 10 days ago. Um, yeah. British had it. Yeah, so British uh, is assigned to it. The way I think about this is we will either close it or with, creating some new ones or let British finish his investigation as to what else he wants to handle. There's no functionality here per se that I see, which is not yeah. covered somewhere else. It's more of tracking and I can go ahead and mark it for alpha so, three if, if that will help. Sure, I mean, I, yeah. Okay, so we'll just mark um, it for, okay. Yeah. The other the other one um, I'm curious on, which kind of has implicate, I mean, has a number of implications for work uh is the signature filtering um we have the spec for that and other things and i'm just kind of curious what um you think in terms of timeline there signature footprint uh sorry. yeah let me let me um <clears throat> this issue here Basically, yeah. Are you sharing it in chat? Uh, Milan has his hands up. Uh, Milan. Yeah. Um, I think I wanted to make a couple of call outs in the, where you showed the release notes, the alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, if you go there. Yep. So yeah, I would not go by the strict definition of what alpha three says there that- what I agree, I agree, three. we need to, we need to. Uh, update this yeah so for example uh, uh local storage i think we have some i i think the lens i would look at is what, what is the coherent features that we can push out in alpha 3 which gives end user experiences doesn't mean there can't be an alpha 4 or not that is up to us to decide and between alphas to rc i think the determination is are there going to be breaking changes in any features that go in the RC feature set? If there are going to be breaking changes, those either need to be removed from the RC till that feature stabilizes, or you need to work on that feature in alphas, make it stable, and then it goes in RC. So just, just kind of calling out the criteria the way to look at this. Yeah, 
Agreed. I think once we write the release notes, we will update the goal of this as well. I agree with that. And the on the filtering, uh, I think the minimum that is required at this point is to emit the annotation that supports filtering. The actual filtering can be done later. It's an optimization. Or that that is by by alpha, sorry, by RC release time, we should have the annotation in. Otherwise, post RC will have a set of signatures, some of which support filtering, some of which don't. So, so we can move that feature out of alpha three if we want to, but it, it needs to be there in RC one at least. Okay. Okay. The, the biggest, the biggest, I think, thing for me that we know is still feels like up in the air um, is the trust directory store work um, and how that impacts the CLI. Um, I, I don't know all of the changes. We know that there likely are breaking changes in the, the cert and the key, um, but that's my, I guess, my big concern um, that we, if we push that out, then we're potentially going backwards from functionality uh, where we are today with, with an alpha three, unless we maybe do some things to kind of fix that, right? David, did you say directory? Did I get you right? The direct, yeah, the directory store. I mean, the trust policy, directory store, directory structure work, right? Because I know JJ just, uh, JJ Gao, you know, right? He, he just did the work for notation go, um, and that was merged, I think, yesterday or today. Um, so that's where I feel like, I don't know. I, I, I think it's important to try and move forward there um, because what I, I but I, I just, um, it feels like a decision we haven't quite landed on. Um, I, I know, like, I know on your side, you're, you're saying let's not have the CLI at all. Um, I, I feel like it is pretty important to have from a user experience because right now, uh, at least in our workflow, you know, we use notation insert and notation key, and I think that's um, a big usability factor uh, versus people trying to download and manually copy files over to some store location. Um, and then we're, you know, then gonna go in RC1, right, add it back in. And so it's just really kind of jarring in terms of, of that. Um, but I don't know what else is, is broken um, other than that. So I, just a thought, like I, I, I agree with you. I am concerned about the usability. Um, having worked on runtimes and tooling, you know, Microsoft here. It's just there's always that that tension and balance. The tooling is relatively easier to put a little churn on, and it's easier to kind of to gloss things over. It, it's a, it's it's fortunate and unfortunate that we already have a great great a good usability story today, and we are talking about unwinding it temporarily. But the thing I'm much more concerned about is the stability of the runtime and data formats. So I just thinking as far as an alpha three, right? Yeah, I'm just trying to get the right term here. The alpha three stability, let's on making sure that we're stable from a non-breaking change scenario, getting the directory structure and the new um, uh, policy formats solidified and get our hands on, play with it, see what we like and don't like, uh, feels like the right bar for an alpha three and then Maybe we already have start having some PRs for bringing the, the CLI experiences back to, to bring back the usability. Um, but I, if I think about what I would punt out of Alpha 3, like Alpha 3 can't be RC1 and then we just flip the bit on it. Um, I think we need to focus on what is the really core pieces that are changing between Alpha 2 and RC1 and use Alpha 3 as that landing place. And all of this trust store policy and directory structure stuff is the, the biggest turn. Yeah, and if I, I mean, if I, in a, and if I had to, uh, you know, pick one of moving everything forward to its current state using all the latest APIs and knowing that CLI things are broken um, versus waiting much longer uh, potentially, and then having the C the CLI experience polished, I'd rather I'd rather do the former, just in the process of since we are in alpha and moving everything forward um because you'd rather do former sorry i lost track of which was i'd first. rather i'd rather so i'd rather have i'd rather have everything at its latest and and then that way we're going to actually know what's broken 
Um, and so what if you're, you're arguing bring this, keep the CLI in alpha three. I'm just well, trying to you keep it, you keep it, you keep it, I mean, you keep it in knowing that certain things are going to be not working if that's where we're at, right? I mean, like if it's- You like, want to keep the command and it might just throw an error temporarily. Yeah, yeah, just, and then we can state that in the release notes or whatever. And then like at least, that way, at least that way we're moving forward because even if people are copying, you know, copying uh, files or whatever, like, I mean, at least we're going to, you know, not delay- uh, or find bugs much later in the process or, or other things that we may need to fix or consider that we hadn't before. So what's the delta between alpha three and RC one? Is it just stability? Uh, well, yeah, there's a number. I mean, there's quite a few things. I mean, I, we, we have the login, we have the directory structure. I mean, there's been a lot. I, I think what Samir and I need to do is just go, because we're, we're running out of time here, uh, is we need to go present, like, you know, like I said, roll up, where all the changes that have happened since the last um, milestones uh, and releases, and because there's there's quite a bit there, um, and and just and then relate that back to the user stories, and and then and then like I think go from there. I mean, we're not talking like six months here, so I think the delta between Alpha three and RC one should be quick. So maybe maybe saying it is stability, and we're willing to put stuff in that we're not 100% convinced about yet, but we have the alpha three to RC1 window to tweak things. So I, I'm putting it out there as an option. Like I just, there's gotta be some delta between alpha three and RC1. It will be. And it could be quality, oh, yeah. or it could be features. I, I know oh, that no, no, no. that's the yeah. yeah, I there. think the lens I'm looking at is to release an alpha three, what we have, uh, as quickly as possible. And if I were to draw an artificial line, I will say by the end of the month, let's get the alpha three out. And it's an artificial line I'm drawing. We'll, um, we'll, we'll go back and look at the milestones and then decide as to what. I, I yeah. wouldn't draw that line. I think you would want to take a look at what's done. Um, you will take a, want to take a look at what is um, a set of things that can be used for a set of tests. Um, and if we are close to kind of, you know, if we have developed enough things where we feel like this can be used and tested and we can grade code feedback, like we can cut alpha three tomorrow, right? Um, I think it's a question of the user stories that alpha three is going to support and what that's going to allow people to kind of go out and test. Um, I don't think it should be that, you know, we're at the end of the month, let's cut an alpha three or, you know, it shouldn't be date restricted. Um, we have built a lot of uh, users, like we have built a lot of features. I think um, to an earlier point, we haven't really done the best job of tracking these to user stories. So maybe let's go through that exercise. Um, and I think the, the reason we were asking for the RC1 user stories is really to understand um, what's the gap in user testing, right? Um, from an RC1 release. I think if you have those two sets of user stories, then we can go close on that fairly quickly. So I think just to echo what I'm hearing from David is one of the user stories is usability of those commands. So I think that's the question is. Yeah, I agree. Like that, that is in the product. We're destabilizing it because we believe the directory structure and the policy is work that we want to do. We said we wanted to do it. We always plan to do it. The question is do what, how do we converge the usability and functionality? That's really what's about. I think the, the directory structure and the trust policies don't necessarily um, impact the usability as much as the CLI commands do, right? Because the directory structure is more of how do we enforce the directory structures and how do we make sure those can't be changed? So um, to given the kind of like the setup path, it's a little bit hacky, but it, it wouldn't necessarily kind of impact like, you know, how you're um, using notation per se. Um, so I think the-, it, the Today you add something to, quote, I'm air quoting, the trust policy by calling notation key add, or notation cert add. That, that yep. was the usability for how we put stuff in the store. Today we're changing the store to be a directory structure and a config file, another, a different config file, all supportive, but there, there is a usability story of calling a CLI versus having to drop and, and copy file. Like writing that, writing that word, that, that document to explain how people do it, makes a pretty big difference if we don't have a CLI to do it. 
Yeah, and I think that's a great conversation to have of whether we want this to be an alpha release or not, right? Like if you feel that customers can't really go or anyone can't really go test this and configure that, then I would argue that we need to get that CLI work done on how to do this for an alpha three, right? Um, and that's the conversation I think we should be having is that do we have enough uh, usability defined where alpha three is going to be testable or do we need that CLI functionality to go in before we release an alpha three? And that's what I'm deferring to David and Samir to go sort out. I just I think the key is where the the delta here is we already have those experiences and those commands. Do we lose them and then bring them back, or do we keep them and just replumb them, or maybe they're broken temporarily because it is an alpha that demonstrates the intent to fix them. So I, I'm just highlighting the scenario. I think the Obviously, we don't have the answer. That's why we're deferring to David and Samir to go sort that out. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, let us come back and propose a uh, release notes as to what will be the availability. What what can people do with this alpha three, and then we can iterate on that. What is what what is how does a customer use it? Yeah, like we have those today. It's it's reasonable. It could be better. As we add more functionality, what does that getting started document look like? Yep. Okay, I think we're at the top of the hour. Um, I'll put the really, I'll put the what we discussed here, and David, uh, we'll look for some time that we could meet again before Monday, if possible. Otherwise, uh, yeah, we do it on Monday. Yeah, yeah, it'd be good to see if we can sync up before Monday. But yeah. Okay. I'll take the action item to write the release notes uh, as to what I think uh, should be there, and you can iterate on it offline with me on that. Okay, thanks. Sounds good. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, folks.